Tony, thank you very much for giving us your time and what a career you've had, by the way. Uh, so just starting out at Everton and breaking into the first team picture at the end of Howard Ken Kendall's incredible successful side. What was that like getting into the sort of team as a Premier League player? Well, I grew up. I grew up when Howards was uh, when when Everton under Howards managing in the eighties. That was my team. I, I grew up watching. I mean, some people are lucky enough to watch their team at a successful era, and some people are unlucky that they miss all that. So, the new generation, the Evertonian kids. The new fans who are who are much younger than me, they they've not really seen any. Well, they haven't seen any success. And yeah. we, we were uh, we had quite a number of years of being the best team in England. And what what a feeling that is to go and watch a team every week who were the best team in England, and then probably one of the best teams in Europe. So when I come through to Everton, Howard was and Colin Harvey, they were like um, our idols and. Mm. They were someone who you um, sort of revered and were a little bit tentative around them until you get involved in the first-team mentality and how life is and then you see different sides of people. But obviously, playing for Everton was my local team and it was it was an honour. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so you started to make league appearances in the 94-95 season under Joe Royal. A season where Everton actually eventually up winning the FA Cup, beating Man United one nil. What was that like to play with the incredible players that you played with? Well, I was actually on the bench in the semi-final. Hmm. Me and Amikachi were on the bench in the semis, and people asked me what my favourite game was. And even though I never got on, I always say the semi-final because it was just, you know, we hadn't had success that club since I was a fan. Yeah. And then we played at Ellen Road and we had three sides of the stadium. And unless you were there, it's very hard to describe the drive up to the, to the ground. And actually beating Tottenham 4-2, I mean, it's, a, it's an unbelievable semi-final yeah. score line. So yeah. you, yourselves, you're all football men. You, you know, it, it's it's an unbelievable feeling. And to do it at another ground, it, it's even better than doing it at your own game. You know, you, you've all travelled like, like an away game, isn't it? Even though it was a neutral venue for both teams, yeah, it was just special. And I always, I always hold that game down as the finest moment as my time at the club, even higher than my own debut, mm. because I know it meant so much to everyone. Yeah, it's still what I assume what Everton fans look back on in somewhat recent memory is the mm. the greatest moment they've had, isn't it? Like you say, they've been pretty start of it and it's certainly overdue I would say now yeah, yeah I mean we are we are a really big club and, and yeah. I was only speaking to one of the new signings the other week um, we were just signed like boy, a boy Josh King and we're a good friend of Josh's I was only speaking to him before he went to say until you play for the club you don't really realise how big this club is yeah you know when I was playing for Everton we, you play away from home and um, I don't know. Say you got three, four, five thousand tickets, whatever you got. Everton, they're, they're sold out. They're gone. The away travel is unbelievable. It's yeah. it's up and down the country. It's Tuesday night, and it's full on. Your full allocation, if not more. No matter what where you are in the league, they've had a full house for years. The team have been poor for years. And they still get the crowds, and they always will because yeah. they are a huge club. Yeah. But until you really play for them, you don't really understand how big they are i think another point i think we we tried to cover it the first time we tried this uh tony when we did this the other week but what was it like for you as a young man coming into that dressing room like we mentioned the characters there i mean neville southall dave watson andy inchcliffe duncan ferguson how were they as, to the young players <coughs> well, well dave watson was 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 the captain of the club and you know, we led by example on and off the pitch. Dave Watson is probably the finest captain I've ever been involved to play under. He, he's like what you'd call a proper man. Mm. And when I first come in, Duncan wasn't at the club when I first come in because he'd come on loan originally. So he wasn't at the club. But there was plenty of stalwarts at the club, uh, big names. But, you know, when you've had the exposure as a youngster and you're almost 
tra- you're training with them when you're 16, going on 17 anyway. Because certain personalities can actually handle being around them people, it was never it was never a big thing for me. It was never like I'm playing with all these players. It was just go and play with them and give me the ball. It's, you know, yeah. I think most of the players who go on and had careers or have careers is they're not fearful of playing with better players. They take it in the stride and it's it's not even a challenge. You just you just get on with it. And if if you're good enough, you're swimming. If you're not good enough, you sink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, in 1999, you joined Manchester City, rejoining yourself with Joe Royal. You played in that City team as a quite a starting regular. What was that like with sort of their journey back to the top? So I imagine that was right at the beginning, weren't it? Not really. No, uh, I joined them when they were in the Championship because they actually went down to League One, City, um, somehow. But anyway, it happens. I joined them in the Championship. I probably shouldn't have went. I probably, sh- even though Man City's a great club and it's not against Man City, it's, um, I had 18 months at Everton still left and I left late December, just then going on January. But they were top of the championship and I actually found it hard to get a game. Mm. And I'd come from Everton and, you know, I'm young and I want to go and play. And then, you know, it's how people take disappointments, they take it in different ways. I think the youngsters now have been educated to, take disappointment better than my era. Hmm. So I, I never dealt with it great. Uh, but but anyway, I was there. We got promoted to the Premier League while I was there. I got to play with Andre. We brought Andre Conchelskis to the club. Hmm. So I got to play with Andre again, which was good. I got to play with Georgie Weir, which was great. And then we got relegated again. <laughs> and then Kevin Keegan came in the year after the championship. And I was, I was in the team, but I wasn't playing well. And... In the end, Kevin brought better players in to play who were playing better than me, and the opportunity to go to Burnley arose. Yeah. And I, I, I wanted to go and play, so I decided to go and sign for Stan. Yeah. So, why, what did you mean by uh, the taking the disappointment a little bit differently, sort of to back then to nowadays? Do you think because there's so many different sort of I don't know, training aspects to it. It's like a lot of mental side nowadays because they have different coaches for everything now, don't they? Well, you know, I'm a coach. Yeah, I yeah. deal with players and uh, success and disappointment in a manner that my coach has never dealt with it. So, you know, how you talk to people. So there's, if you're getting some disappointment, there was never a mechanism to deal with it. Some some players could, but lots couldn't. And lots of us at my era probably made wrong decisions on the back of disappointments. Whereas now, there's more support mechanisms. The coaches are just yeah. better. They just, they just understand it better. And they understand the individuals better. Then days, it was almost, get on with it. Mm. And, you, and, you know, I am a bit... I, I, I'm fine with that. I was always fine with that. And I was even fine with City. But looking back, I probably didn't... I probably didn't handle disappointment great. I probably yeah, took yeah. it the, you know what I mean? So, so yeah, makes, I was just going to say, you mentioned, obviously, it went and signed for Stan. I'm just wondering, we've had a, quite a few guests on now who've uh, mentioned how uh, how Stan was, and as a Burnley fan to me, uh, certainly a legend in our eyes, but um, what was that like? Because it's fair to say he's a character. Yeah, and, you know, a lot, a lot of my career... And in that either, there was characters, you know, the, you, you are lacking in characters these days. Mm. I mean, a manager makes a joke and everyone thinks it's funny. It's, it's not really character. Them fellas, had, they, them fellas had natural character, whether they were having a go at you or whether they were having a laugh at you. It was natural character. No one was ever put on. And Stan was no different than a lot of that either. He was a, an honest man, he always say. He's an honest man and give you his, he gave you his verdict. He was very fair. And he loved to play football the right way. I've got nothing but good words for Stan, to be honest with you. So, all that level. And I went through a stage where me and Stan didn't get on for a short, short period. And when I say I didn't get on, we did get on. It was just, I wasn't playing well enough for a couple of months. And Stan let me know about it. Yeah. Yeah. But then I actually did knuckle down the right way. And it was only a couple of months. I, mean, I knuckled down the right way and everything was fine again. But I've only ever got good words about Stan Terrence. Yeah, I think most have, really. They just always um, comment on the fact that, you know, he's 
certainly a character, you know, he'll let you, like you've just said, really, it lets you know when he wants more from you and everything. And certainly for me, I mean, I'm not a footballer, obviously, but in, 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 in my profession, I'd rather that from my manager. And I guess it's the same for players. You just want to know where you stand and have that transparency, don't you? Yeah, and when I say he lets you know, I mean, he's not coming in... Tra- these people aren't coming in training and, mm. and, and being horrible and letting you know every day. I mean, you've got to manage the situation. You've got to manage 25 players, 25 men. Yeah. And you have to manage them. And your coaches help you. Your coaches are, your coaches are really important. And when I say he lets you know, he lets you know, you know, you've, you've nearly only got one game a week. And let's have it right. If you haven't played well, there's a good chance you're not playing anyway. Yeah. Most players should be able to evaluate their own performances. And all he was doing is basically saying, look, the reason you're not playing is this, so you need to get better at that. Because if you yeah. don't, you're back on the stands again. So, as I say, when I was young, a little bit younger, I probably took that disappointment the wrong way. Whereas I barely... You know, things off the pitch get interfere with your game, and they do. Probably why I'm probably a better, a, a, de- a good coach now because yeah. I, I've seen an awful lot of things and walked a lot of roads as a player. Yeah, makes me understand the players probably better than most of the coaches really. Where would he? Where would he rank for you, Tony Stan? Under all the managers that you've had, is is he up there or? Yeah, Stan. Stan. Stan's in a top one. Yeah, as top one or two, but I always judge people by how they are as people. Hmm. You know what success we had. Well, Stan, Stan had all the success before the come. When I was there, we almost got in the playoffs. Think we missed out on goal difference. We had good cup runs. He never had much money like some of the other clubs to bring big players in. He was always uh, searching around to try and get better players. He liked to play good football. Sometimes the players couldn't do it, I suppose. But as a motivator and as a person who has run through a brick wall for it, he's got to be right up there. Hmm. Yeah. You mentioned it there, Tony, and that would just leads us on to the next point. That it's funny, the success we've had at Burnley over the last sort of eight years under Sean Dyche, it, you know, it's 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 been fantastic. But as a Burnley fan of you know, I'm thirty four years old, so sort of my generation, one of the best teams we watched was your side. 2001 yeah. 2002 season when we were top at Christmas um, and, and it just fell away obviously I think it was on Boxing Day or around New Year's Day we got yeah. battered by Man City 5-1 I actually, I actually played for Man City that day oh were you still there then yeah, yeah. Um, oh so it was the second game wasn't it so the first time I played yeah. for Man City that season we beat Burnley 5-0 at Tave Moor yeah but then I signed for Burnley and went to Man City, and then Man City put five past us. Yeah, that's, that's the game. That's the game. Yeah. And at the time, at the time, we were top and they were second. And I always think back to that game. I think Glenn Little missed a penalty, um, yeah. and it it really just unravelled from there. I mean, we're one of the only teams to I think we're about twelve points clear of third place to miss out on the playoffs from that position. I'm just wondering, from your perspective or in the dressing room, what what do you think went wrong in the second half of the season? Well, you know, it, it, it's football such a fine line, isn't it? It is such a fine line. So you just mentioned there the penalty getting missed or not given. So, yeah. you know, sometimes you go through a bad spell and things just don't go your way. You, you have shots that hit the crossbar and come out or shots that hit the crossbar and go in. So maybe in the first half of the season, we've rolled our luck and we're getting more points than we should. But once you're up there, you're up there and... You do need a little bit of luck and you need a little bit of money to recruit at the right times. Yeah. Um, were they highly overachieving at the time and then they never had a big enough squad to back it up? So there will be lots of elements. It won't be through lack of trying or anything like that. It, it, it can just come down to a little bit of luck and other teams are winning when you're losing, you just can't handle it. Yeah. So it's hard to put your finger on what it really was, who knows? A bit of everything. A bit what of everything. something behind the scenes, then a big bust up or no juicy story where where it all went wrong. <laughs> like that. I mean, yeah. let's have it right, Burnley at that time. It was just a small, small club at a town. Yeah. A way yeah. town. And you know, Stan brought them up from nowhere. The next minute they're in one division behind the premiership, which is 
the promised land. And he built a team who, who, who were competitive and were fighting. But there were some huge clubs. I mean, as I said, I played for Man City. We put five past Bay on that tape floor. And City went on to, to sign all kinds of players. Huge budget. Hmm. So there's massive clubs in the championship at the time. I think Bay, that was Burnley's first year up in the championship, or maybe first or second year. Yeah, from, second, I not, think it was, yeah. Second, yeah. So we haven't been up there that long. Mm. So it was an achievement to stay. Stan probably overachieved, to be honest with you. Yeah. And like most fans, we get carried away as fans, don't we? We expect more and more and more and more. Like I'm, I'm sure you're a Burnley fan now. I'm sure you're probably expecting top 10 now. Let's get top 10. <laughs> yeah, um, let's get to- somewhat. I try to be more realistic myself, but yeah. <laughs> not many, there's not many who are realistic, you see. That's the problem with football, but... Oh, yeah. not, not the problem with football. That's the dynamism of football. Everyone just wants that little bit more, don't they? Yeah. yeah. One thing that season, Tony, I felt I, ha- I just have to ask about. We signed a certain Paul Gas going in March. Didn't quite go to plan on the pitch at Burnley, but what was that like to play with Gaza? And what was he like around the club? Paul Gaza, growing up, was my idol in England. He was the English idol. I mean... I still say to today, even though we've had some great players, and I always say Paul Scholes is one of the best players I've ever seen play football. But Gaza, for me, is the, the best talent we've produced in all these years. So that's what I'll always say. So when we signed him, I was over him. And he was, he was unbelievable around the place. What, 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 a, what a personality. And that, as you say, you know, he's obviously coming to his end then. And it, it, it didn't turn out great for the club as in where we finished. But it was a, it was an honour to play with him, to be honest with you. Yeah, that's good to me. Yeah. Um, so, go on, sorry, Luke. I was just going to ask as well, on that around that era, um, you played with a couple of players, Tony, who, I mean, the, the kind of fulcrum of that team was obviously yourself, Paul Cook, Kevin Ball, but then yeah. in the attacking line, the likes of Glenn Little and Robbie Blake and, Real legends of the club, they really are. Um, and I always wondered from a the perspective of someone who played alongside them and also played in the Premier League as much as you did, it, 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 it always confuses me how they never really made that step up much. And I just wonder from your perspective, was, was it just maybe a lack of pace or do you think they have the ability to play at that level? Well, I play, with, I play personally with a lot of great players, but I think Robbie Blake always gets in my 11 because yeah. and you know you can, I can put him next to Andre Kinchelskis and I can put him next to George Weir and I can put him next to Gascoigne's um, you know put him next to Gary Speeds and all these great Richard Gops all these like great players mm. I'm happy to put Robbie Blake in with them all I, I think he would, you know, says a lot he's a superb player two-footed can beat you, can score a goal when you think, how's he scored that? I mm-hmm. mean, you and I've seen quite a few of them. Um, what, what you find is when, when, when you're recruiting, you, you know, Robbie was small, wasn't he? Yeah. And, you know, on, on visual, he doesn't look the athletic type or the quick type. He's got a little bit of beef on him. Yeah. So I can half understand why the big clubs don't go for him. But talent-wise, I mean, he was um, he, he was on a different level. Yeah. You know, you saw him like maybe going to watch a Peter Beardsley, who's small, um, but he's outstanding. Someone takes a chance on him. Robbie Blake was an unbelievable footballer. Yeah. He's got to go down as one of the greatest ever Burnley players, ever. Has to. It, yeah. it certainly yeah. for me. Yeah, That's where we're at. And I've seen the likes of, you know, Stephen DeFore, a Belgian international playing for us in the last few years. And Blake is still up there. And I, I always look back to that and just think someone like him should have been given a shot. It always just sticks out yeah. to me, really. And, and, and Glenn. Glenn was just unorthodox. Until you've played with Glenn Little, you don't realise how good Glenn Little is. Mm-hmm. Glenn Little was an outstanding footballer. Really was an outstanding footballer. And I hold them two in the highest regard of two of the best players I play with, yeah. Awesome. It would be great to hear your full uh, 1 to 11 one time, Tony. <laughs> Get you back yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's quite it's a few players. <laughs> it's going to be overloaded in forward lines if it's got George, <laughs> Weir, 
gas going, Glenn Little, Robbie Blake. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a cracking team. Yeah, yeah. So just looking at then your final season under well, with Burnley under Steve Cottrell, a season which in pre-season you only had eight players registered. How did Steve differ to personality-wise against with Stan? Yeah, it's a huge difference. Steve, Steve never really had a personality. <laughs> Stan was full of personality and character. Steve never really had that. Uh, but he was very focused, Steve. He was very focused. And I think he was, a, I'm right in saying, he was a young a young manager. Uh, he obviously wanted to, he got a chance at a big club like Burnley. So he's got another chance of becoming a manager. And he worked, he worked hard. He did, he worked hard. He brought in a couple of good players, quite a few good players. Yeah. He brought in Michael, who I thought was a very good centre uh, midfielder. Um, Johnny at the back. He brought in Frank. Mm. You know, we we bought. He brought his recruitment there was was decent. He never had much money. So I think as a as a manager, he worked hard. He was he was pleasant enough. He just just never had enough about him for me as a player. Um, and and the team's done okay. We you know we were battling, we were battling that year because we never had a big squad. We never we were battling, we were battling. Um, that was the year we knocked Liverpool out the cup, wasn't it? Yeah. And I think we had a couple of good other cup games. I think uh, it was Aston Villa we played that year as well. Was that the same year? Yeah, we beat Villa. And you know, and he, he was lucky that we had. I think we still had we still had Robbie. Was Robbie still there? Was Blake, no, Robbie was still there. Of course he was. Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, we were doing quite well, and I think we sold Blake in January. That was the so, that was the yeah. season we got. We sold uh, Robbie and and Richard Chaplow in January. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So yeah, no, Steve was a a decent enough manager. And was that the year was, that you had? Sorry, Luke. Um, I'm sure, you're going to say the same. Yeah. Gary Cahill. Yeah. End up at Burnley. Yeah, and and uh, Wits, uh, Wits came as well mm. from Villa. Uh, Gary, I think it was Villa. Gary came from Villa. Yeah. Two, two obviously, it's sad about Wits. Um, yeah. Great young lads. Got on with, got on the team spirit. Got on with the whole living in Burnley and working hard with all the players. Yeah. And then they had the football to back it up with. Yeah. Did you see them going right to the top, Tony? Obviously, two cracking careers, both of them. To be honest with you, yeah. Gary Cahill, which was always going to be a good footballer. Yeah. Gary Cahill was always going to be a much, much better player and go higher because he was athletic. He could spring, yeah. but he could play football. The yeah. boy could bring the ball down his chest and want to play. So, yes. yeah. Do, do you ever know where they're all going to go and what career they're going to have? No, but you just knew he was a good, really good footballer. Yeah, he was so confident. He was only 18. He'd never played first-team football before he came to Burnley. And just remember at the time, my dad telling me, he'll play for England in. And he says that about a lot of players and he's often <laughs> wrong, but they were right on that one. <laughs> yeah, he also had good senior players around him. What, yeah. what a good low move. He had John mm. McGreal to help him. He had Frank Sinclair. He had myself in front of him. You know, he had a lot of good senior players to help him. And funny enough, I actually went up to watch Chelsea train when um, Rafa was the manager a few years ago. And I, I bumped into Gary uh, having his dinner and, you know, straight over to have a chat. Mm. You know what I mean? So he's always been a good guy, isn't he? Grounded mm. guy. So you go on loan to Burnley, roll your sleeves up and get on with it and go and learn. And that's what he done. Yeah. yeah. You, you mentioned the cup, the cup games that season, Tony. One that always sticks in Burnley fans' mind is that was one of the first few get for, for years that we'd played Blackburn Rovers. Obviously, we, we did end up losing at Ewood Park in pretty much the last minute or something like that. And since then, I'm happy to say we've finally overtaken and we've won, our, I think, our last five games against them, which I will throw in there. But um, what was the atmosphere like in that? It's one of the world's oldest derbies. There was a lot of, There was a lot riding on that game and we didn't let ourselves down. You know, well, before that, I'd played in the, I'd played in the Liverpool derby and I played in the Manchester derby. Yeah. So I thought I'd seen it, most of the things, but then this derby just became more vicious. It was yeah. just, it was just more vicious. And you know, it led into the game. And us being a Championship team and then being a really good Premiership team at the time, for us, us as players, we just didn't want to lose for the fans. Yeah. So. 
it probably stopped us playing much football as we just didn't want to give anything away. We just wanted to stop them. And so we can walk out at the end knowing that they haven't come to our patch and beat us. That was the main goal. And really saying there wasn't it wasn't much of a game. It was a little bit about stopping each other playing. Yeah. And but seeing the, the ground path, we hadn't had a path since I'd been there like that. It was the atmosphere was electric. Yeah. Not losing was huge. Yeah. No, we didn't let ourselves down, considering the, the relative finances of both club at the clubs at the time. Yeah. Absolutely ridiculous, really. Right. That's right. Good to see that game again. Blackburn need to sort themselves out. Nah. No. Well, maybe a cup <laughs> game. Then. Maybe, uh... Leave them where they are. It's fine. <laughs> So since your playing days has come to an end, Tony, you've been an assistant manager in three different continents. Mm. How are you finding your current role as assistant manager at SE East Bengal and the assistant manager to Robbie Fowler? Well, me and Robbie have been friends for, since we're, funny enough, since we've been 10 years old. Wow. So, you know, find photographs of us on Google when we're playing football that are 10. So our relationship's been over 30 years long, which is mm. unbelievable. We actually live by each other as well. Yeah. So we done our badges together. We used to, we've always gone to watch football wherever it be in, in the UK. We've always gone to watch football. We've been to the European Championships and the World Cups together. So we are football people yeah. and love the game. And you know, as you get to a stage, I done all my youth coaching at Blackburn, um, and then it gets to a stage where you go into the first team and. You just go on a, a, a certain pathway and then Rob gets a job in Australia and we took over the club who, to be honest with you, they finished the season bottom of the league the year before. So it was a big job. It was a tough job to go to a different continent, different country and try and put in place on a small budget stuff to help the club, you know, recruit better people. And to be fair, we've done that. We've done that and then the club have prospered from that. Now we're at another club, and this club's absolutely huge, by the way. Mm. This club's this club's humongous over here. Fan wise, fan wise, it's you're, you're in the you're in, in millions. Fan wise, it's it's mm. a country that's got over a billion people in. Yeah, you no, know, you know, it's you put it into context. The UK got what sixty odd million. This has got way over a billion. Yeah, so it's a huge country, and this club's a huge club. But it's its first year in the ISL. The ISL is basically the new the new league. It's been going for about seven years, eight years. And it's a tough league. You get a lot of foreigners who are good foreign players over. It's 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 a little bit like Australia. Um but the infrastructure in, in the previous years on the development hasn't hasn't been where it should be. But it is it is catching up. Now some clubs have got good academies, so it is catching up. So what you'll find over here now is a lot of the younger players, the 19-year-olds, the 20, 21-year-olds, they have a really good level, really good level. And I think as football develops and gets more popular, I think India, because it's so big and there's more clubs spend the money with academies now, I think you'll find in hopefully the next 10 years, there's more better youngsters coming through and yeah. Eventually, they'll lead themselves into a national team, and hopefully, they can start competing with certain other countries. Yeah, yeah. It, would, it would be good to see. Sorry, Tony. I would, oh, say, it would be good to see because it's such a huge country. I think I don't think I'm wrong in saying I think cricket's the the main yeah. sport out there, yeah. isn't it? Which they're obviously <laughs> one of the the very best in the world. But yeah, such such a big country. It'd be great if they could develop into. Well, they love, I think they all love the Premier League over here. Mm. Yeah. We every fo football, regardless of what country you're in, like so Australia, cricket's one of the biggest sports. Yeah. And India, cricket's one and, and there'll always be probably the number one sport. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but the future, the future people the future kids, uh, everyone gets attracted to football. It's mm -hmm. I know I know in America, I know it's uh, I think it's the most fastest growing sport mm -hmm. in America. And I know in Australia, up until like under fifteens, there's more kids playing football in Australia than anything else so in these countries it will keep growing and as long as these clubs are giving the youngsters opportunities and you can see pathways then the future of Indian football 
should definitely prosper. Yeah. And, and it's well, great. Sure. It's only going to help sort of guys like yourself, Premier League legends and... and well, it, it's, it's, good, it's good for the youngsters. It's good for hope, you yeah. know, a bit of hope and, you know, the learning. So if we can get more academies built where you're educating the kids, because this world's a different world over here. It's yeah. a different world. I mean, for instance, I, I won't, we've got a young kid here with us, and he's he's 18. Mm. Now, he's training with us every day in this hub, and it's been good for him because he's getting fed properly. Mm. But these are kids who, some of them, not all of them, but some of them have got no diet. Yeah. Like, this kid's got no, he has no protein. Mm. He never had no protein in his diet, which is, for a young sportsman, it's almost impossible to yeah. grow and get stronger. So being this hub's been great for him. So now we know all that. Hopefully we can put plans in place for these types of kids. But once academies get properly done, mm -hmm. so many kids will benefit from it. Yeah, that's quite great. Absolutely brilliant. If it's all right, Tony, we've got a, a quick little quiz for you, if that's all right, all about your career. Yeah, I probably won't get many right, but let's go. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's all right, Tony. If you get one, then you've not done uh, you've not done the worst of the guests we've had on. So, <laughs> um, right, okay. So yeah, it's just all, all about all about your career. Um, so number one, you made over two hundred league appearances in your career. How many Premier League appearances did you make? Probably around about one hundred and ten. It was seventy-one. I, I should have put some options in there. That would that would really. I'd say that's brutal. <laughs> yeah, I just realised. I meant I normally put three options for them type of questions, but yeah, seven seventy-one. Sorry. <laughs> um, number two. Um, so I normally ask all of our guests who they were sent off uh, against, but yeah. you were never sent off. You were you. Were no, I, was, I was very. Uh, I was. A, I could tackle. You see, the difference with me. I like to tackle, but I could actually time a tackle. Yeah. And I would, because I had it in my brain. I've very, I've very rarely got yellow carded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. lots of these fellas who keep getting yellow card, most of them can't tackle. Yeah. Yeah. Just this time. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So I've, I've had to mix it up on question, question two. So we've not had many, many charity shield players in. So I've gone with that. So you started the charity shield for FA Cup winners Everton, 1995, and that game still breaks me out. By the way, it's my earliest football in memory. I think watching oh. Everton beat United so thank you for that um, <laughs> you, the FA Cup you mean or the Charity Shield well the, the FA Cup is, is my earliest memory um, uh, yeah. but then yeah you went on obviously um, to play in the Charity Shield you won the game 1-0 who scored the goal Vinny Vinny scored that yeah Vinny Samways um, question 3 you signed for Burnley on the 11th of October 2001 made your debut a couple of days later against who I'm going to say Forest. Correct, Nottingham Forest. Uh, a 1 0 defeat. I think yeah. it was just a couple of days, wasn't it? No transfer in direct. I come on sub. I'm sure I come on sub in my game. Yeah. I could be well forth of it. Um, so, yeah, you you're doing well. Two from three. Um, so, number four, which teammate did you make the most appearances alongside in your career? And I've got some options now. <laughs> it's Ian Thomas Moore, Robbie Blake, or Graham Branch. I'll say uh, that's so fun because I'm sure they were up the three of them were all ever present. I'll say Moro. Yes, 127. Um, and Robbie Blake was 95, Graham Branch 98. So. Yeah, very good. Final question. Uh, you scored three goals for Burnley. Who was your first one against? Coventry. It was Coventry, yeah. I guess. Now my my memory is actually better than I thought. <laughs> actually, I'm actually pleased at myself. <laughs> it was a, a three one win. Yeah, I think I've probably uh, I've probably done you out of five from five there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I've voted the greatest goal ever scored at Turf more than this. I don't know, Luke. You'll know that. What was that? Sorry, I said my goal against Coventry was the greatest goal ever scored at Turf more. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to say anything offensive. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give it you. Pine of Pine, certify that as the greatest goal ever at Turf Moor. There we go. It's official. Yeah, it's official. <laughs> as official as we can be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Tony, that's it. Thank you so yeah. much. I'm no 
so grateful that you that your internet's held up as well this time. No, it no, was no. an amazing chat. Um, thank you for giving me yeah. time. Thank awesome. well, you. Welcome. Good luck. I'll see you. Speak to you maybe you. in the future. Eh? Brilliant. Thank you, Tony. All, all the best to East Bengal as well. Yes. Cheers. Cheerio. Cheers, Tony. Bye. 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 Pie and a pie. Pie and a pie.